Now let's change gears and discuss postnatal growth and development. In order to understand changes in growth, we must first understand how growth is measured. The term anthropometrics refers to the measurement of human growth and size. Measurements can include height, weight, segment length, like the length of my leg or the length of my trunk, breadths, like shoulder breadth, circumferences, like my waist circumference, and body composition, including body mass index, percentage of body fat, or percentage of body muscle. You can also derive values from these primary measures, like ratios between the shoulder and hip. You can compute percentile rankings, and you can also compute changes in these primary measures, like height velocities. And you can compute other measures like body mass index. These measurements need to be done carefully and systematically in order for you to make correct inferences about what these values mean and how they change across time. In particular, percentile scores are often used to determine those that are significantly outside the typical ranges, for example, for those that fall above the 90th percentile or below the 10th percentile for height, may have a disorder that affects growth, like a hormone deficiency or too much of a particular hormone. Similar to prenatal growth, all humans undergo a predictable change in body growth and overall development. This pattern is consistent, but it is not linear. Rather, it's S-shaped. There is a period of rapid growth during the first two years. Then there's a gradual but steady increase in growth during childhood. And then there's again a rapid growth during adolescence. Although the general pattern is consistent on average, the precise timing of growth spurts and the relative position of an individual with respect to his or her peers or his or her percentile ranking often differs. Recall in lecture one, we discussed several scenarios in which individuals differed in the amount, rate, and timing of height across pubertal development. The timing, magnitude, and amount of change over a period of development is equivalent to the change or slope of its growth. Some of these indices are sensitive to environmental factors. As we will see in the later slides, weight and body composition in particular are very sensitive to environmental factors, including exercise and diet. Here I am showing you a figure of one individual that falls well below the 50th percentile across all ages measured. However, there is a big difference around age 14 in which the growth in height is unexpectedly low and may represent some type of major change in environmental factors. This change may indicate the need for an intervention, for example, a hormone treatment or a nutritional intervention to help increase the growth back to the normal ranges. The differences between males and females during childhood is relatively small. Generally, males are slightly taller and heavier than females across all ages. However, females mature much more quickly, and at any given age, they are biologically more mature than their male counterparts. The adolescent growth spurt occurs earlier in females. The age of takeoff is usually about 9 for females and about 11 for males. Interestingly, adolescents begin their growth spurt around one year plus or minus around the average time of takeoff. When we think about growth, we often think about height and weight. A growth chart plots height and weight on the y or vertical axis with respect to the individual's age at measurement or the x or horizontal axis. We think of these growth charts as distance curves. What is meant by this is that we can see how much your height or weight has changed each year as an absolute value. In physics, we think of distances as an absolute raw score. For example, I walked 10 feet. In the context of height, I can say that I grew 10 centimeters. The purple and blue lines on this chart indicate the percentile rankings from the 3rd, 5th, 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, 90th, 95th and 97th percentiles. This means that if you fall at the third percentile for any given age, 97% of the people at your age are taller or weigh more than you. These percentile values matter because if you fall in the top 10% or at the 90th percentile or higher, or in the bottom 10%, your values could be considered abnormal. I have plotted an individual's height in black circles in this height chart. As I previously mentioned, although this child starts within the normal age ranges at around two, the older he gets, he starts to fall below the 50th percentile consistently. 
Importantly, around age 14, he is no longer growing and is falling very short of his age expected height. It is at this time when medical intervention like growth hormone supplementation may be necessary to have this child grow or to get closer to the normal pattern of growth during adolescence. Since there is a major change in this child's relative position around the age of 14 in terms of height, his or her parents or physicians may determine that there is some reason that is affecting his or her growth and can intervene with some type of treatment. In addition to measuring the total height or distance, we can also derive or compute a rate or velocity of growth. Like in physics, velocity represents the change in distance divided by the change in time. So to compute the height velocity, we compute the change in height from one measurement point and divide that value by the amount of time between the two measurement points. For example, if I grew 10 centimeters in one year, then my velocity would be 10 centimeters per year. Similarly, if I grew 6 centimeters in 6 months, and this pattern of growth continued for the next 6 months, then my growth velocity would also be 10 centimeters per year. The height velocity chart is useful in identifying when rapid changes in height are observed. Unsurprisingly, this change occurs during the early phase of puberty. The peak height velocity, or the peak in the height velocity curve, is earlier for females compared with males, since on average, females go through puberty earlier than males. It is important to note that if the height velocity curve is going down, it does not mean that the individual is shrinking. What it means is that the rate at which the individual is growing is less than the previous measurement. For example, at the peak, the average female is gaining around 7 to 8 centimeters per year. After the peak, those females are still increasing their height by around 5 to 6 centimeters the next year and around 4 to 5 centimeters the year after. When we look at the weight growth curve, we see a slightly different picture. First of all, the spread of weights for each year is quite large. For example, at age 20, a male could weigh between 120 kilograms to 220 kilograms. The reason there is so much variability in the weights compared with the variability in the height measurements is that weight is very susceptible to extrinsic factors. For example, changes in body composition due to diet or exercise. Weight can also change due to disease. Some diseases cause massive weight loss or massive weight gain. Despite these differences in weight, the change in weight across age, or the weight velocity curve, follows the peak height velocity. What I mean by this is that the peak weight velocity often occurs around two and a half to five months after the peak height velocity in males, and around three and a half to ten and a half months after the peak height velocity in females. So far, we have talked about total growth in terms of total height or total weight, but over the course of development, specific body parts have different rates of growth. As mentioned before, growth follows two basic principles. Growth occurs in the cephalocaudal direction, meaning from head to toe, and in the proximodistal direction, meaning from near to far. The head represents one quarter of the body size in infants, but only one eighth the size in adults. The legs represent three eighths of the body size in infants and half the body size in adults. The legs grow faster than the head and trunk during infancy and childhood. Growth in height during adolescence and adulthood is due to an increase in total trunk length. Importantly, differences in weight, length, or growth of different body parts have direct impacts on movement. As we saw in Chapter 3, weight or mass affects balance, inertia, and force production, as well as linear and rotational velocities. As with total growth, there are some sex differences in the relative growth of different body parts. For example, in females, the shoulders and hip breadth increases at a similar rate. In contrast, in males, there's a considerable increase in shoulder breadth during adolescence without much change in the hip breadth. This ends up resulting in different body anthropometrics between males and females. Recall our definition of development, growth, and maturation from Lecture 1. Development is a change in behavior and the process underlying that change. Growth is a quantitative change in physical size, for example, height, weight, 
or the relative weight and height of different body parts. Maturation is the progress towards physical maturity, and specifically, it is the biological readiness for reproduction in terms of physical, hormonal, and reproductive system capacity. As we have discussed before, two children of the same age could vary drastically in their physical maturity. And in many of the figures and charts, we have used age as a proxy or approximation of physical maturity. Now we will discuss what we mean by maturation specifically. When we talk about maturation, we talk about the development of secondary sex characteristics. For females, we focus on breast development, pubic hair, and menarche, or the first menstrual cycle. The chart here shows the height velocity from 10 and a half to 16 years and the timing of the different secondary sex characteristics. We can track breast development on a scale of one to five. In this chart, B2 and B5 represents early and late breast development. The development of pubic hair is also ranged from one to five. And on this chart, we see P3 and P5. We can also mark the onset of menarche. As you see, menarche typically occurs about 12 months after the peak height velocity in females. When we talk about maturation and secondary sex characteristics for males, we typically focus on an increase in the size of the testes or scrotum and the development of pubic hair. Some researchers will also examine the development of body hair more generally, including facial hair as a marker of maturation in males. Since sperm production develops gradually, unlike menarche, there is no clear marker for the onset of sexual reproductive capacity in males. For both males and females, the determination of stage of maturation is typically done by a physician's examination. But there are parent and self-report questionnaires that can be used to ask questions about pubertal development in a less invasive way. These questions tend to be less accurate because children and teens have difficulty saying how developed they are or rating their development compared to picture charts. And parents often don't know how developed their children are. Preteens are much more modest around their parents than little kids, so it's hard to determine breast or testy size in a female or male. So far, we've talked a lot about measuring growth and maturation. I have mentioned that factors like nutrition, diet, and exercise might affect growth, but I want to emphasize that like the period of prenatal growth, the primary factor that contributes to postnatal growth is nutrition. In cases of malnutrition or disease, we often see a big change in growth. This change depends on the timing, severity, and the duration of the period of malnutrition or disease. The chart on the right shows in blue the normal pattern of growth over time. The purple line represents an individual that is undergoing a period of malnutrition or disease that changes the pattern of growth. Interestingly, there is a phenomenon called catch-up growth, in which following a period of malnutrition or disease that stunts or slows growth, once the individual is able to get good nutrition or recovers from the disease, he or she will begin to grow at a faster rate and will catch up to where he or she should be if he or she had not experienced that period of malnutrition or disease. Basically, the body grows more quickly in a short period of time to compensate for a period of slow growth. Okay, let's summarize what we have discussed regarding early postnatal development. First, we have examined the use of growth charts for height and weight to measure postnatal growth. We think of this as a total distance, or total amount of growth. Second, we can derive or compute measures of growth rates by examining the amount of change in height or weight over a period of time. We consider these measures to be height velocities or weight velocities. Third, in addition to total growth, like total height, total weight, we can also look at relative growth of different body segments or body parts. Fourth, when we compare males with females, we see a similar pattern of growth. However, females begin growth spurts earlier than males. This change in growth in females is due to precocious or early maturation compared with males. In other words, females go through puberty earlier so that their peak height velocity will occur earlier than that of males. Lastly, in addition to intrinsic factors like genetics, Postnatal growth is affected by extrinsic factors, such as diet, nutrition, disease, and exercise.